Good evening. Um, it is now officially on September 22nd, and I would like to call to order the Concord Municipal Light Board uh, meeting uh, tonight. This is a special uh, virtual stakeholders meeting for our citizenry. Uh, this is an opportunity to learn more about our advanced metering system project. And so we have representatives from the uh, Municipal Light Board here, along with our consultants from Lemhart Consulting who are going to be uh, organizing and orchestrating our meeting tonight. So um, welcome to everyone who's here. We hope you find this beneficial meeting and we look forward to your feedback. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over. Who am I turning this over to? Dave, Laura, Barbara? Barbara. Okay, Barbara, all yours. Thank you. Great. Barbara, you muted. Still muted. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I'm Barbara Leary. I am unmuted. I'm with Lemmerhurt Consulting and I'll be helping to facilitate the meeting this evening. We have a very full agenda and I'm gonna turn it over to Dave, David Wood to um, make a few introductory remarks. But before that, I'd just like to take you through some information about the meeting and how you can participate if you want to. So do be aware that the meeting is being recorded and it'll be posted later to the CMLP website. We have about a 20 minute presentation prepared for you. And after that, we will open for questions and comments from Concord residents. And we do ask that um, residents only please speak. If you do wish to speak, you can use the raise hand feature on Zoom during the Q&A session and you will be invited um, into the panel in turn. And when it, is, when it is your turn to speak, if you would please state your name and address, you'll have up to two minutes to speak. And we do ask that you please try to observe that time limit so we can allow time for anybody that wants to participate. You may also offer written commentary through October 1st. And there's an email address here, ask about AMS at concordma.gov. You can also find it on the website. So what we're gonna go through is um, we'll have a project overview from Carol Hilton, and then Laura Scott will take us through the goals of the advanced metering project and how those align with the strategic plan that CMLP has had in place since 2017. Jackie Lemmer Lemmerhurt will touch on the need, the rationale, the benefits of advanced metering I will give the highlights of a survey that CMLP commissioned this past summer. And then back to Jackie for an overview of the technology. And then um, Jackie will close it out with um, some information on how the vendor and the solution will be evaluated and selected. And then we'll open it up for questions. Our panel here, in addition to the panelists I just mentioned, Bob Hill is with us to answer any questions you might have with regard to water operations. And so with that, David, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Barbara. <clears throat> Welcome, and thank you for being here. The purpose of this meeting is to update you on the advanced metering project and invite your input. Your input will, be, uh, will, inform, and, and will inform the development of the request for proposal that will be issued for the project. Uh, it's important to note that no vendors or solutions have been selected. This, is, this step comes first. Uh, I would also like to emphasize that there will be no fees or surcharges added to customers' bills related to the new system. Carol Hilton will uh, take us through the project timeline, and then Laura Scott will uh, review our goals for upgrading to advanced meters. Thank you, Dave. Good evening, everyone, and uh, happy first day of fall. Based on the complexity of selecting a new metering and communication system, we decided to hire a consultant to help with the development of the request for a proposal for this project. We engaged Lemmer Consulting, an expert in water and electricity meter deployments in the Northeast, to help us determine the requirements for the metering system analyze potential benefits, and develop a request for a proposal. As shown on this project timeline slide, we're seeking holder input in September, 
and we'll be developing the request for proposal specifications over the next 30 to 45 days. The RFP will be developed following this meeting and will be released in the latter part of October with a view towards selecting vendors early next year and signing a contract by mid-2022. And with this, I'll turn it over to Laura and she'll walk through the ways in which the metering upgrade will help us meet our strategic goals. Thank you, Carol. And thank you everyone for being here. Uh, you may have noticed we're trying to speed through these slides because we don't want this to be about what we have to say to you, but more about what you had to say to us. But speaking to CMLP's vision, goals, and initiatives, as you can see on this slide, um, smart meters are a foundational element of the CMLP strategic plan that was approved by the board in 2017. On the left, you'll see listed a number of CMLP's goals. Foremost among those goals is reliability. We also want to decrease greenhouse gas emissions and we want to increase customer satisfaction and the value proposition that the community owned light plant offers to its ratepayers. Meters with two way communicating capability, which Jackie will explain further, are needed to realize CMLP's goals. They will improve the reliability of our distribution system, providing the most available uptime possible. They're required to let solar customers net meter, which makes solar power more economical. For owners of electric vehicles, they will make it possible to offer lower rates at night for charging, which will make driving EVs cheaper. They're needed if customers want to participate in load control programs to receive lower rates. And they will offer features that can help customers reduce their energy costs and help CMLP improve efficiency. The bottom line is these meters are needed for us to meet our greenhouse gas reduction, system reliability, and customer satisfaction goals. The system we have now, or systems as Jackie will describe them, are reaching their end of life and not what we need for the future. Um, Jackie will expand on the need for advanced metering further. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Laura, and good evening, everyone. Um, to start off the project, my team reviewed the metering technology that's currently in place at CMLP. And so right now we'll talk to you about the metering technology that's used today. There are two systems in place at CMLP, a drive-by metering system that's been in place since 2007. It reads both electric and water meters. Most customer meters are read this way. In 2011, an AMI system was installed for a small number of customers, primarily for those customers participating in programs like the water heating load control program. Both of these systems use wireless radio frequency technology. The meters used for the drive-by system are nearing end of life and must be replaced. This solution does not support the needs of future programs and goals like Laura just talked about, and it offers no path to advanced metering functionality. A small number of customers, just over a thousand, have AMI meters installed today. This technology has been unreliable and does not have forward-looking functionality. This is an electric only system and provides no benefit to water customers. Laura reviewed the goals for the advanced metering system, but let's take a closer look at the benefits CMLP wants to get out of the system. These would be reflected in the request for proposal that will develop in the next step of the process. So at a high level, the data generated by advanced meters enables a wide range of benefits. There are many different ways to deploy an advanced metering technology, so it's important to align the potential benefits with CMLP's goals. The main goal is to improve reliability. We've all seen how climate change is causing more severe weather events, and CMLP wants to be proactive about creating a system that's more responsive and resilient. Right now, CMLP doesn't know when your power goes out unless you call or there happens to be a big event. That will change with the deployment of smart meters. In most cases, smart meters send an alert notifying utilities that the power has gone out 
so utilities can get to work right away restoring the power. So you might be out to dinner, you might be at work, you might be on vacation. Um, CMLP would know to start restoring your outage. The data generated by smart meters also provides valuable insight into the health of the power grid and for water customers can help detect water leaks. The CMLP staff is very excited about all the ways the advanced metering system will help them work more efficiently and safely. Improved efficiency and utility operations translates into customer benefits in terms of improved reliability, customer service, and more convenience. It also helps keep costs down, which keeps rates reasonable and aids in greenhouse gas emissions. The environmental benefits accrue in a variety of ways. First, by reducing the number of visits the utility staff must make to customer homes for like a final reading or to inspect infrastructure. The usage data collected by smart meters can help utilities better understand demands on the system and more efficiently integrate renewables into the power grid. It also enables programs that provide customers with the ability to take advantage of clean energy programs and opportunities like Laura spoke to, as well as incentives to encourage them. In terms of direct customer benefit, here are some of the advantages smart meters can offer. We talked about reliability. When the smart meter alerts CMLP of an outage, you can be notified too. You can choose to receive alerts for both electric and water events. Advanced metering enables customers to see how much energy they're using right down to the hour. So through online portals or mobile phone apps, you can see your usage data. Many utilities also offer the ability to set alerts to be notified if your usage exceeds a set amount, much like the way you would set it for uh, your bank account or a credit card. An advanced metering uh, system is essential to offering time of use rates, which can help customers save by using energy during off-peak periods. Uh, now I'll turn it back to Barbara to talk about the results of the customer survey. Okay, I'm going to hit the highlights here, um, and you can find the full report on the CMLP website. Um, but essentially, to have the benefit of as much customer input as possible, CMLP commissioned Great Blue Research to perform a survey. The intent of the survey was to get a reading on customer awareness, understanding, and also how residents of Concord would prioritize the benefits, what's most important to residents. Um, the survey was fielded in July, more than 1,000 residential customers and 46 commercial customers responded. And let's take a look at just a couple of the highlights here. So although the awareness was relatively low, um, interest in smart meters after um, the survey participants read a description of the meters, um, we saw that about um, uh, more than two thirds of residential customers and about 50% of commercial customers were interested in having a smart meter. Now about 16% or 27 of residential and 27, 27% of commercial aren't sure, suggesting that they need more information before they can make up their minds. Laura and Jackie alluded to the importance of reliability and that came through loud and clear in the survey. When the survey participants were shown a list of potential direct customer benefits, reliability ranked first um, by a pretty wide margin. So the question was, or the, the statement was, the meter will alert CMLP if your power goes out, so CMLP can get to work right away restoring your power. And you can see that more than four-fifths of participants on the um, residential side felt that was the most important benefit. Um, and the majority of res residents surveyed also thought it would be helpful to have access to an online dashboard that could help them see and um, monitor their energy usage. In terms of, of efficiency benefits, so operational efficiency benefits um, that can help the utility eventually deliver better service, better reliability, reduce greenhouse gases. Um, the customer surveyed had a good appreciation 
for the value of smart meters to enable CMLP to manage the system more efficiently. So you can see here um, how these different um, items ranked. So more than four fifths of the residential customers and about three quarters of commercial customers indicated that this benefit was important. Now Jackie is gonna take us through the current state of technology and some of the options that are available. Thanks, Barbara. So an advanced metering system is really more than just a meter reading system. It, it is a foundational technology essential for increasing reliability, expanding customer programs, and supporting growth in electric vehicles, renewable energy, and microgrids. An advanced metering system consists of three components, electric and water meters with two-way communications, a communications network, and the software to manage the equipment and processes. I'd like to take you through each component of the system. Meters are the energy measurement devices. Electric meters are solid state with integrated communication modules and extensive computing capabilities. The meters gather energy usage data in increments from one minute to one hour. Meters can also compute energy for time of use periods. The meters have capability of sending alerts to utility for a wide range of events, including if power goes out. Electric meters enable a wide range of customer programs through a single meter. They also provide data to monitor and manage the grid. For example, if the growth in electric vehicles um, increases significantly, it's important to be able to understand the demand on neighborhood transformers and prevent transformer overload. The project will also include advanced metering for water as well as electricity. The expanded capabilities also extend to water monitoring. A collecting detailed water usage data helps inform customers of their water consumption and helps identify leaks. New water meters are solid state and are highly accurate for measuring low flow. Water communication modules are battery powered and rely on wireless transmission to send data to the nearest electric meter. Now, the second part of the advanced metering system is the communications network. So in our diagram, working from left to right, the utility network is the central landing point for the data collected by all the meters. The advanced metering software is managed from the utility network. Now, the wide area network consists of collection points often called gateways. Gateways are positioned throughout the distribution system on utility poles or other elevated assets. Meter data from neighborhoods are accumulated in the gateways then delivered to the utility network. Since CMLP has broadband, fiber can be used to deliver the data for the final leg of transmission to the utility network. Now using existing broadband may be a very cost-effective solution for CMLP. The field area network has the most options and complexity. The field area network delivers data from every meter to the gateways. Now, if a meter is close enough to a gateway, meters can send their data directly to the gateway. Otherwise, meters pass their data to a neighbor meter. Some field area networks are designed so all meters communicate to a gateway. This is called a point to multi-point network. Now, when meters communicate with their neighbors, this is called a mesh network. Now, since water meters and their radios operate with battery power, water meters mesh with an electric meter neighbor. This is done using wireless radio technology. Communication options for the electric meters are both wireless and wired. Now, the wireless options include radio frequency and cellular, just like your cell phone. The wired options are either power line or fiber connected to the meter. Now, lastly, the home area network is used to communicate from appliances inside the home to the meter using radio frequency or Wi-Fi. This would enable CMLP to offer customer programs so customers can save energy and cost. So how would this work in a typical resident? So let's take a look at some of the options. If a customer is a broadband subscriber, 
the fiber connection to their home can be used to read the meter. For a water meter reading, the water meter will transmit its data to the electric meter. That electric meter may be a link to other meters in the communications network than to deliver data to the wide area network. Now, if a customer has an electric vehicle or battery storage and is participating like in a utility program like net metering, those devices can be measured and data delivered using a power line carrier option. And then if customers choose to participate in programs that CMLP offers, such as the water heating load control program, the data from those devices will communicate wirelessly to the electric meter. Now, the third component of the advanced metering system is the software that orchestrates the communications at all levels and monitors the network. Additionally, the software provides operational grid analytics to help improve service and reliability. This software delivers data to the utilities customer information system for billing. This is now commonly offered as a cloud solution from the vendors. So the next step in our process is to select a vendor and a solution. So CMLP has made no decisions on technology or a specific solution. We're just starting uh, to ask the following questions. Can CMLP use a mixture of communications technologies? And can CMLP take advantage of its broadband network all the way to the customer home? How is the solution positioned to address emerging trends, especially with increased electrification? The solution's gonna be around for 15 years. Is it adaptable and expandable to meet future requirements? And lastly, but very importantly, we'll be looking for solutions that use the most thorough security to protect the data and ensure data privacy. Now CMLP has just begun identifying requirements but we're looking for your input into the solution requirements. Once that's done, the request for proposal will be prepared and released. And we're planning around the end of October to do this. The solution proposals will be evaluated by the CMLP team who will be working with the solution day to day and my consulting firm. The vendor solution will be selected based on its ability to meet the requirements, as well as ensuring that CMLP achieves its benefits. Now I'll turn it back to Dave for Q and A. Thanks, Jackie. <clears throat> so now we'll open it up for um, Q and A. Um, if an attendee has questions, you could raise your hand. I'm going to promote you to the panel so that uh, you can turn your video on and um, ask your question, and then um, I'll put you back as attendee, and we will um, have some panel answer the question. So is everyone ready? Okay. First question, bringing Linda Neiman in. Hello, Linda Neiman, 59 Mallard Drive. Um, I came in a little late to the meeting, so my question is regarding the timeline. I'm 100% behind the smart meter work and I appreciate all the hard work everyone's done and these were fantastic presentations so good job everyone. Um, so can you give me a, a timeline because you know the sooner we get this done, the better. Sure. Um, Carol, could you uh, go through the timeline again. Uh, do we want to slide again. Um, if not I have a, a hard copy okay, here. I think you can talk through it. Yeah, so um, we are uh, seeking stakeholder input through uh, the end of September. Uh, we'll be working on um, developing the RFP and um, identifying spe specifications over the next 30 to 45 days. And then, um, we do expect to have the RFP uh, ready to go. Um, and uh, we expect to have vendors Early next year and signing a contract by mid uh, 2022. Thank you. I'm going to bring in um, Debbie Healy. Let's 
It's a little slow. Oh, I guess I brought in Pamela Dritt. Pamela? I have a quick question, which is, can you please um, allow everyone to see what I see as a panelist? So we opted to use the webinar for this because we had a meeting uh, just a week ago where we had 185 people that wanted to get on and our license only allows for 100. So this, this format allows 500. So that's why we chose this option. Um, and we're just gonna go through the, the process the way we are. No, but I mean, you can still show them participants and the raise hand function and um, even on a webinar, you can allow them to do that using the system. I know because other town meetings do it. Please do it. Uh, I'll take a question later. Okay, we have seven questions. Um, Hi, Debbie. Hi, um, I'm at 77 Riverdale Road and thanks so much for the presentation. Um, it's great information to have. Um, and from my point of view, it, this is just, it's, it's a no brainer. And so I'm just wondering what exactly do you need from the community um, to help move everything forward with what you'd like to do? Yeah, so we, you know, we really felt it was important um, prior to moving forward to have, you know, a forum such as this, we were hoping to do it in person, but obviously with the pandemic, we're, we're doing it um, via uh, this Zoom. But uh, we were just looking for input um, so that when we develop, when we finish developing the RFP, we, we have considered the community input. And that, that's really what we're looking for. Okay, so is there anything else I could do after, after this presentation tonight? Um, I mean, if you have, other comments and whatnot, you certainly can email um, email them to that email address we showed early on. Um, those are always helpful. And okay. you know what I would do with that information is I would circulate it to the board, um, and uh, that way everyone's informed and we can make an informed decision. Okay, great. All right. Well, thanks so much. Presentation was great. Thank you. Next question. So Ron should be coming in. Good evening, Ron. You can ask your question. Yeah, uh, I. Uh, full disclosure, uh, I used to work for ITRON uh, back in the 90s. And our existing uh, AMR infrastructure actually uh, I worked on. Uh, and so my question is, is there any uh, need for someone like me with a background like that to uh, help uh, in your selection process in any way? Um, potentially. I mean, if you want to uh, drop me a direct email, we can communicate um, outside of the meeting and, and go from there. Okay, I will do that. Right. Any other question? Uh, just a general uh, encouragement saying uh, this is definitely the right direction. And I think you guys are definitely doing a great job here. Thanks, Ron. And Hi, I did it. Um, my name is India Hessenstein. I live at 167 Elsinore Street, apartment four. Um, thank you for this informative and inclusive uh, presentation. I, um, well, first of all, back to the question about the schedule, I just need to say 
that if you're only giving us eight more days for um, input, because um, that's 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 really not a lot of time. So I hope that that wasn't right. Um, maybe you can address that. But secondly, um, just to give you a little background, uh, I'm, I'm I experienced your survey as a sales pitch. I didn't really feel that it covered um, all of the techno techno technology issues and risks related to this technology. You didn't discuss the conflict, um, the fact that there's people in the world out there who have really high sensitivity to radio, high, you know, radio frequency. Um, and there's a lot of, there's legal cases happening right now addressing that with the FCC. And um, for me personally, I mean, I, I am an energy engineer. I worked for many years um, as a mechanical engineer doing energy conservation projects. This technology is very familiar to me. I love it. I promoted it. I sold it. Um, and I think it's great from all of those perspectives. But I really feel so strongly that you have got to think about disabled and elderly and people who, people who have sensitivities. And I realize that you have, you're thinking about an opt-out um, option and that will work for people who live in single homes. But a lot of seniors and disabled people and low-income people don't live in single homes. I live in a multifamily. Um, I live in, in an apartment on the first floor and right below my bedroom, I have eight electric meters. And I measured the RF in my building um, and it's not great. Alert you to the time. Huh? Okay, all right, so so my, quest, my question is, what are you planning to do to protect people who have sensitivities to protect people who live near large meter banks in multifamily buildings. And what I would encourage is that you um, look at either um, direct wiring those buildings to get your data or providing shielding for the, the tenants. Okay? Thank you. So if you could answer that question about schedule and about what you're planning to do to protect people with sensitivities, I would love to hear that. Yeah, so we'll have to take a look at the schedule. I don't know um, if the eight days is actually what we have, but we, we might be able to adjust that if that's actually what it is. I mean, eight days for us to all get our input feedback back is what you're saying right now. Yeah, under advisement, we'll... Uh, okay, Thank and, you. and the other question? Yeah, we're gonna have to look into that. It's something um, that, you know... It's we, something we've been bringing up to you, Dave, for several years now. I met, I met you two, two or three years ago and brought this issue up. So if you're saying you're still looking into it and you haven't come up with any solutions yet, I'm really concerned. I'm concerned for my health and safety. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Page is coming in next. Good evening, Bill. Bill, you're muted. Sorry, I apologize, Tim. So I'm a, a full disclosure, Bill Page, uh, 702 Lowell Road, um, also a clean energy investor. Um, so I just want to be transparent on that. Um, I think my question is best suited um, uh, for, I'm sorry, I lost the, Jackie. Um, on the existing AMI uh, meters, you had said they weren't reliable. I just wanted to know potentially why they were not reliable. And um, second question, um, is there anything in the existing AMI or AMR infrastructure that could potentially be leveraged uh, for the rollout? And then third question is, is there anything uh, for funding at the state and local level today? Thanks, thanks very much all. Thanks, thanks Bill for your question. Um, on the, the first item, um, the system that's in place today, that it's used for a very small number of customers. Um, it's used for the water heating load control program. And um, that's been hit or miss in its ability to actually do switching on and off. So it's been unreliable from that perspective. 
Um, the other issue with that is it hasn't been fully rolled out to across the entire service territory. So that limits its performance as well. Um, so that's a, a concern. Um, I'm sorry, your second question, could you repeat that? Yes, yeah, so my second question was, is there anything in either the AMR or AMI infrastructure that could be leveraged, do you think, um, in this uh, metering rollout? I mean, you said that it's the end of life on AMR, but is there anything um, on the data side that, that could be leveraged uh, from uh, CMLP? And then the third question I had, I'm sorry, was just on anything on the funding level at the state and local uh, level to help with uh, financing. Yeah, um, the AMR system itself is pretty old. It's been around for a while. Um, and there, there really isn't much there that you're going to be able to keep. Um, obviously, for opt-out customers, any potential opt-out customers, you might be still using that technology for that. Um, but I think the, the key to a, the new solution is going to be really leveraging your existing fiber um, that's in town and try to use as much of that a, as possible, because that's going to keep your overall um, life cycle costs pretty low um, and is a good, um, a really good, reliable solution. Right. And then funding. Just one, one editorial comment just from the prior question. I think um, one thing that could be done is uh, for CMLP to distribute white papers on uh, metering human health, because um, I've, I've sort of been cognizant and following the meter industry for, for 20 years. And there's, um, in my, I'm a share owner of uh, ITRON and there's uh, no human elements. And I think if you stress uh, meter location, I think that will be many of, uh, of the concerns. Thanks, I'll leave it there. Great, great effort and great presentation. Thanks. And on funding, um, you know, I'm not so sure what's available on the state level. Um, and I know the, you know, pending infrastructure bill, um, you know, does offer some funding, but I'm not sure um, Dave could probably answer better or Laura could answer better on how Concord might be looking at that. Laura, could you answer that for me? Sure, Dave. So um, there was quite a bit of funding for this type of effort some time ago, probably almost 10 years now, when the idea of smart meters were first being rolled out and a number of um, communities were able to get funding, almost full funding to put these systems in. Um, Concord uh, didn't participate at that time. And um, nowadays it's not the new thing around. And so there are fewer sort of uh, willing grantors of money to, to uh, test pilot this to see how it goes because they're all, you know, something like 75% of all the meters in the United States are now actually smart meters. So it's not new anymore. And um, the ability to get grant funding now is more tied to whether or not we could actually harness this project with other uh, more contemporary um, projects, such as, uh, you know, there's been a lot of emphasis on um, microgrids and being able to island uh, important infrastructure. You know, would there be some way that we could tie in the smart meter project with something like that? Um, so we are looking into that. Um, we haven't identified anything to date that we're aware of that would work today. But as Jackie mentioned, with the infrastructure funding bill still being legislated, um, it's possible that something could end up in that legislation that would uh, enable us to be able to get some money to help with this project. Thank you, Laura. And Janet. That was a very interesting presentation and I'm excited smart meters are actually coming. My question is about timing and with particular relevance to my one of my neighbors who just had solar panels installed. They were just installed in the last week or two. And she was told that she they weren't going to be operable until there were smart meters installed. So I don't know why that is, uh, whether she's got it totally wrong <laughs> or, or um, um, anyway, perhaps you could clarify. Sure, we have, we have um, smart meters back ordered for the solar customers and um, 
they just keep getting pushed back by the manufacturer. So I think that's what she's referring to. Um, I don't know, Carol, if you wanted to add to that. Nope, I, um, I agree with what you said. At this point, we've had some meters on order now since um, even before June, like March, April. Uh, we were expecting shipments in back in June, then it was July, then August. We still haven't received them yet. Uh, we still get weekly updates that it's going to be anytime this week or next week, but we did not receive them. So there's been quite a back order on them. I think Janet might be um, confused because we're using the word smart in a couple different instances here. So the meters we're talking about tonight, Janet, about replacing the existing, we have two systems in place, right? We have a drive-by system for 90% of our customers, and we have an AMI smart meter system for 10%, people with solar and load control. We're proposing to replace all of those meters, both systems, with new two-way communicating systems, which we're calling advanced metering. Okay. Well. So what we're talking about with your friend with the solar is we need to get more of our existing smart meters in, okay, which were back ordered, to be able to put her solar online. She's not going to have to wait for this new advanced metering system to get her solar online. Yes, yeah. and okay. I, I have an update as of like two minutes ago. Um, we actually did receive 32 smart meters, the AMI meters in today. They came in this afternoon. So, uh, <laughs> Excellent. Timing couldn't have been better. So okay. that'll, that'll take care of that issue, Janet. Thank you. And Sheldon Hines will be coming in next. Hi, Sheldon. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Good. And I don't know how to get my picture to show up there, but that's okay. It doesn't work on this thing. I'm, um, my name is Sheldon Hines. I'm at 74 The Valley Road. I wanted to um, address several different points. Uh, some of these are questions and some are comments. The first one is, what is the minimum benefit to cost ratio expected? Uh, the reason I'm asking this is that the benefit to cost ratio of the of a smart meter system is much lower than what the town imagined event, uh, previously. The only measurable societal benefits of a smart meter system, as opposed to cost savings to the utility, are reductions in energy usage by trucks collecting data for billing. That is unless there's a way to have the uh, hardwired um, connections to the smart meters and have people agree to have their uh, have their systems connected in a hardwired fashion to the to back to the meter, uh, back to the the, the um, load plant. The reason you're having trouble with your your existing hot water heater systems is that uh, wireless systems were never designed for this purpose, and there's no technology now that allows that to happen. What is needed is to have a functional requirement. That the that this be able to happen, and then uh, I haven't seen any functional requirements. What I want to comment on are functional requirements, not so-called benefits as exposed expounded by the by the by the industry. Um, so if we so even if the um, you know we receive the benefits of eliminating trucks driving around, the wireless networks consume tremendous amounts of energy, and and the cost of operating those wireless networks could, could possibly far exceed the savings of, of eliminating the trucks. Uh, next question, is there evidence you can share of actual experience of utilities achieving net energy savings because of a smart meter system? Excuse I haven't seen any evidence of that. I know that some other uh, towns have, have put out RFPs like Littleton but um, I'm, I'm, as I'm, I'm not aware of any, anything that, uh, you know, that actual, any actual real uh, benefits, such as Brian Foles has been asking for for years. Although the meter data management software will provide some information useful to grid planning, this value is dubious because the same data can be acquired from SCADA systems, system control and data acquisition networks that all utilities have long had, and I hope that Concord has. Uh, the present 
grid planning value of smart meters and scatter networks become rapidly out of date because of the increasing use of local solar energy. Many ut utilities are, in, are instead implementing advanced distribution management systems that provide real-time information of this nature. ADMS would probably be a better way to spend your money of it not on a simple smart meter system as it has been uh, sold by the companies such as ITRON for years. Uh, that's obsolete technology. And if you look into ADMS, which may be what, um, what Jackie was talking about, but it's not clear, that is a better way to go. And um, so my, another question I have is um, what, what documents, what experts told you that a smart meter system would actually achieve any benefits at all? I have never seen any document other than uh, pro information provided by the utilities themselves saying that smart meter systems are the way to go to achieve net energy benefits, such as what people like uh, Brian you know, ha ha want. My experience is that we, that has to be a functional requirement that they prove that there can be net benefits of energy savings from these kinds of systems, as opposed to an ADMS system. Because um, you, um, if you expect a, a smart meter system such as you're going to buy to be able to take control of air conditioner settings to achieve energy savings, that's just not going to happen with a wireless system. And that's, that's absolutely clear. Tim Sheckley, the consultant that we have used and, the, and that Laura's talked to, can expound on that to great extent. We need, we must have wired uh, capabilities for the people who hope to have the, their, their air conditioners and other uh, equipment in their homes to be controlled and to actually achieve the savings that you want to have. This wireless, the wireless concept is, is not is, is, does not work at the moment using the existing technology. So functional requirements have to be established and people like me need to review those and have more than eight days to review them as to exactly what you hope to achieve rather than relying on the, the sales pitches of the vendors. The concept of focusing on benefits only is not the right way to go. The focus should be on functional requirements, things like net energy savings, the ability to connect to, to uh, to the homes of people who want to have their air conditioners controlled. All that stuff needs to be put in writing and handed out to people like me so that we can comment and get comment, get experts such as Tim Sheckley to comment as well. Um, and so um, those are my comments and I, and I hope, I don't think you're gonna be able to answer them right here, but the, the one comment, I, one thing I want uh, uh, Jackie to say is, are you considering ADMS systems as opposed to the simple smart meter systems proposed by ITRON. Thank you, Sheldon. Um, so Sheldon, with regard to ADMS, that definitely is the, um, you know, the trend in the industry. And what I'm seeing from some of the vendors is really a, a convergence in smart metering as an aspect of ADMS. So that certainly will be considered and I hope you'll, you'll send us an email with your comments um, so we can make sure that we incorporate some of this um, into our RFP. And I just want to remind people, if we can try and keep the comments to two minutes, uh, that way we can get to everybody. Uh, that would be helpful. Um, so I'm going to bring in um, Gail Heyer now. Dave, could I just, uh, I, I would like to comment on one thing, because I've heard a couple of folks mention this, and I just would like to briefly address it so that we might be able to solve some confusion here. Um, Sheldon is mentioning that the, you know, the latency and the speed with which wireless communications operate cannot perform the delicate load control that could help uh, balance the system and integrate renewables. But what I want to say is there are different types of load control. Sheldon, we've been using this wireless communication technology for the last 13 years to control hot water heaters and uh, electric thermal storage units quite successfully. The part that's not working very well is that the um, is it existing software that is supporting those mechanical devices is not um, very robust and has shown us that it has some um, severe shortcomings that have resulted in people not having enough heat or hot water, which is critical. So um, that's a part that's not been working. It's not the technology. Um, wireless communications are definitely fast enough to be able to shut whether they're air conditioners, hot water heaters, or electric thermal storage units, 
off and on in order to prevent us from experiencing, for example, peak related costs and peak related emissions. Okay, we know when the peak's going to occur and we shut these off in advance. It doesn't have to be a millisecond shut off. It can be 10 minutes before the hour shut off and it still provides that benefit. So what you're speaking to is regulation and some other very specific technical load following capabilities that you believe wireless is not suited for. And I'm not gonna disagree with that, but what I will say that doesn't mean wireless is useless for other types of load control. Thank you. Gail. Thank you. Um, thanks for having this stakeholder meeting. Uh, when CMLP removed the analog meter that's on my house, my family had no idea that an RF emitting meter was being placed outside our bedroom walls. And we only learned about it years after the fact. Um, so I am very concerned that Concord is planning to spend millions of dollars on meters that will soon become obsolete. You know, Sheldon touched on some of the concerns and you know, this is an evolving field. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, and Laura mentioned earlier that smart meters are not a new thing. So maybe we want to step back and make sure we are getting the, the best thing for Concord and not just trying to catch up to the 80% of the world that happens to have smart meters on their homes. Um, so I'm concerned that, you know, more harm than good is going to be done here. Many people suffer a range of health problems from RF emitting devices like smart meters and studies have also shown negative effects on natural resources. A federal appeals court ruled last month that the FCC acted arbitrarily in failing to update its wireless safety standards, and it ordered a review of these standards by the agency. And the standards were written in 1996. Um, so wireless meters that comply with FCC rules today may be harmful to our health. Um, Sheldon talked about um, some points about obsolescence. Um, one thing I've, I've been learning about is that, um, you know, the electric power industry is moving from large plants like coal and nuclear, which you know set rates based on demand. It's moving more toward locally uh, generated renewable power, and the systems that will be able to maximize that and let you know cu customers use their own generated you know solar panels or geothermal or whatever it is. Those are th that's the kind of system that we need. So I don't know if what we're considering is going to be able to like let people use their own solar panels, but I think that's where we need to go. Um, and I understand that that's the that fiber based systems are the ones that can do that. Um, I also have a procedural suggestion um, before the town installs new meters, each resident should be informed of Concord's opt out policy um, that allows a non emitting meter. Um, in addition, customers should acknowledge that the FCC was ordered to update its wireless safety standards. Um, so these disclosures will allow customers to make an informed decision about their exposure to RF radiation. Um, and India spoke about that. I really second all of her concerns, especially you know, people in multifamily and disabled and elderly and people who are in, uh, electrosensitive. It's a really very serious, serious health problem. Um, and Concord should insist on buying only the highest performing and the safest technology and not waste money on wireless meters that cannot handle the next iteration of electric power control. Thank you, Gail. Bill Herring's coming in next. Hi, am I in? There we go. I, hi, I'm Bill Herring. I live on Peter Spring Road. First of all, I'd like to compliment uh, the CMPL on their reliability. Reliability is the number one important thing that you deliver. I have seen Concord Municipal Light do things in four hours that it would take the Edison four or five days to do. I think you're right on the money in saying that you want to do this, that you only expect these to last for a short period of time. Some of the other speakers have touched on it. Obsolescence is, is becoming very important in the en energy industry as we see gas plants converted to battery storage and perhaps a future for other types of electricity. The things that we invest in today, 
we'd like to see a fairly short return on investment because it, I think there is some uh, opportunity for things to go obsolete much quicker, much quicker than we think. In my experience with utility companies, it's a bit of a small club. And I wonder, this is my real question, how many vendors, how many potential vendors do you have for this? And what's your ability to vet the reliability of them? And of late, as you've touched on, just the ability to deliver the hardware uh, to install that. So how many think, vendors do you think you'll be, uh, be looking for? And I'd like to close by saying you run a good operation. Thanks, Bill. Jackie, you mind talking about the vendors? Sure. I think overall, there's there's probably about 10 vendors that um, provide technology in this area. Um, I don't think 10 vendors will necessarily propose a solution to CMLP, but we'll have to you know see what our requirements end up being and which vendors could fit those requirements. Um, there definitely is a long lead time right now. Um, the chip shortage um, has really had an impact on meter delivery as well. And we'll probably see that when we start this project. Um, hopefully things will clear up and meters uh, will start flowing and manufacturing um, you know, per normal, but um, everybody's experiencing that right now. How long do you think the rollout will take once, you, once you've decided on it and you start swapping out meters? That's, that's a piece that um, we have to make a decision if we hire a third party contractor to install them or if we do them internally with staff and we haven't determined that yet. That's a you know, later phase. Um, but we did the rollout um, back in 2007, it took about a year and we did it internally. Thank you. Okay. There we go. David. I think I'm myself on. Hi, my name is David Ropeek. I wanna congratulate everybody for this wonderful civic engagement process. Um, my background is first as an environmental reporter for a local TV station, and then as a student and teacher of the psychology of risk perception and risk communication at the Harvard School of Public Health. I've studied the radiation fear issue for since and reported on it since the early 1980s when the first New Yorker studies came out about RF and that whole alarm was raised. So I'm reasonably familiar. And all I'm adding at this point is from all of that expertise, I can encourage the government people who are running this process enough to uh, think carefully and thoroughly about how you communicate about all of this to people. Gail mentioned, for example, oops, some one day I have a new meter. I don't know the details of that, but you can imagine that that raises resistance, fear, concern, um, understandably, quite understandably. In addition, I'm a consumer of a lot of the products that you guys have been mentioning and hope to consume this too. Hope I'm looking forward to it. Um, I find that a lot of the communication is written from the point of view of the experts and in jargon and not in readily accessible form to the user. So on both risk communication about the issue and about technical communication about what it is and how it works when we finally get it, I can't urge you enough to go outside your own realms of expertise and, and recognize the importance of that relationship in how you bring your information to other people. This is particularly important, let me add, it's a very quick addendum in, in the risk field because this is a dispute like vaccines, like a lot of things where there are people who have concerns, concerns are valid, legitimate, but they see the science differently than what the body of the science seems to say. And that conversation happens in risk communication that has to happen respectfully or you have persistent problems that raise your costs and all sorts of things, so. Thank you. And Jim Terry's coming in next.
Hi, Jim. Hi, I'm Jim Terry, 368 College Road. Uh, you can't see me, but that's probably not a problem. Let me see, okay, here we go. Um, Mike, right now we have three meters. And the reason for that is I've got time of use for my electric cars and we have a heat pump rate. Um, when this is all done, I suspect that I will only have one meter, but the wiring in my house is probably going to have to be different. Uh, is that an expense that I will take care of or what's the situation? And I think that's a, a more general question for all uh, users. Um, when the new meter is hooked up, uh, what additional work needs to be done that might be a homeowner's expense? Thank you. So on, on that particular question, um, that's operational and we need to um, figure out what we're gonna do in a situation like that where a customer opted to put in, um, you know, multiple meters for different programs, you know, um, and, you know, does the light plant bear the expense of the change? We haven't um, talked about that yet at that level. And it's a really good question. And it is something that we need to um, talk about and figure out what approach we're going to take. And, and Kemp is coming in next. Hi there, uh, this is Nate Kemp. I'm at 59 Mallard Drive. Um, I had a question uh, which was uh, just preempted by the, the, last, uh, the last speaker, Mr. Terry, uh, <laughs> the exact same question as he did. So um, I'll, uh, I'll skip the question for now and, uh, and just um, voice my support for this project. And uh, I'm, I'm eager to, uh, to have a, a system here in my house with multiple meters consolidated into one with uh, a much better smartphone app and software interface than the current um, smart meters provide. And uh, I don't think it'll uh, be able to happen soon enough for me. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, do you have a question? All right, this is Hani Teluni, Crest Street in Concord. Um, I had a few just clarifying questions. Um, one is, I'm assuming these meters are battery operated, is that correct? Jackie? No, there's, on the electric meters, there's no battery. Um, there is a supercapacitor that will retain uh, time if there's an outage, um, but otherwise there, there is no uh, battery in, in the electric meter. On the water meter side, there is a battery in the radio that's attached to the water meter. Okay. Okay. Um, so you had in your presentation, which actually, by the way, was very good presentation overall. You had a presentation with a scenario with broadband. What is there is no broadband? Are you relying on mesh network? Is that what you're relying on? Um, not necessarily. Um, I think we're, there are uh, point to multi point systems where um, we could design the network could be designed for meters to talk directly to some kind of collection device or gateway on the network. Um, mesh networks are definitely an option um, if there is no uh, fiber present. Well, if, if the house doesn't have a broadband connection then you have to figure out some mechanism to transport the information, right? Right, and so that's why we're gonna be looking, um, one of our criteria will be to look for um, the ability to, to provide mixed communication methods um, from the vendors. We'll be asking the vendors um, if they can accommodate um, a variety of, of methods. Okay. Um, in terms of the in-house appliances and the desire to be able to shut off and or start or something like that, that's obviously an opt-in mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay, all right. Uh, final question, 
is there any clarity on the type of data that's being collected? And if you select one vendor, is one vendor they're going to go, going to have all of the customer database information of Concord with all of the uses, all of the information they have inside their house? Typically, these systems operate without any personal identifying information. The connection would be um, either the, you know, the IP address of the meter or the meter number itself that would then connect into customer information system, which would be a proprietary to Concord. So the okay. metering vendors would not have access to any of that information. So I'm assuming no smart sniffing technology can come and hack the network then. Okay. Certainly we're gonna be asking all those questions. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. And Virginia Hines is coming in next. Hi, Virginia. Hi, Virginia, you're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, um, uh, Virginia High 74, the Valley Road. Thank you so much for holding this stakeholders meeting. Um, I had a couple of comments and some questions. Um, the first is in light of what Ms. Heyer shared, I want to ask each one of you, do you truly understand what making a decision might entail to install wireless meters across Concord? in terms of adding that much more microwave radiation to the general environment when one, no one is measuring the ambient radiation created, and two, that even if those measurements were available, evidence presented in a court of law has determined that the FCC exposure limits you mentioned that you are complying with are not protected. That's my first question. Does that make sense? Anybody? All right, I guess not. Um, I can send it follow-up email and maybe I'll get an answer to that. Um, that, would be, that would be helpful. Yeah, I know it's a lot to absorb. I mean, I've spent 25 years looking at the science on this issue. So um, I can't expect people to just take it in. Um, and on your website, it says like CMLP's existing meters, smart meters operate over a very low radio frequency. Well, you know, there's a whole electromagnetic spectrum. And first of all, the frequency used by smart meters moves back and forth between 902 and 928 megahertz and 2.4 to 2.48 gigahertz, which is not very low on the electromagnetic spectrum. It is microwave range. So that needs to be clarified. And I, in that light, I want to share with Dr. Martin Paul, Professor Emeritus of Biochemistry, and basic medical sciences at Washington State University has to say. He recently published four peer-reviewed papers that explain how exposure to low intensity pulsed electromagnetic fields opens our voltage gated calcium channels in our cell membranes, allowing excess calcium to penetrate our cells, not just my cells, but your cells too. And this leads to production. I know uh, other people have gone over um, this leads to the production of free radicals, oxidative stress, and DNA damage. Potential health effects from these cellular changes include cancer, infertility, neurodegenerative diseases, neuropsychiatric conditions, and electromagnetic hypersensitivity. And finally, on the website, it says, in fact, people are exposed to far lower levels of RS from utility meters than from many other electronic devices used in everyday life, such as a cell phone. Well, this is somewhat misleading because cell phones and other devices are not safe either, given what the FCC hasn't done, which is look at the current science. And more importantly, in the case of smart meters, cell phones and other devices are used voluntarily and exposure to radiation from smart meters will not be, voluntarily, be voluntary, nor will it be escapable if it's built out through the whole town. So I really do want um, some answers to these things and I will be happy to send a follow-up email. And again, thank, thank you, Virginia. 
Okay. David Allen will be coming in next. Hello, David. Now you want to have me. Um, going back in the conversation, uh, three items. Uh, obsolescence has been a topic a couple of times. Um, uh, there was an assertion that the choices that CMOP is making are um, already outdated and uh, they'll just be a wasted investment of millions of dollars. If we stop to think about uh, making choices and of course investments in technology in a rapidly changing world, uh, we can take as a standard that we always want to wait and get the best. Of course, that means we never get anything. Uh, you do have to step into the stream as the ancient Greeks have pointed out to us. Uh, my experience with CMLP is that they actually make excellent choices in that regard. Uh, on the FCC, um, yes, one uh, appeals court among numerous appeals courts in the US has uh, ruled as they have. The reality is that uh, we don't know what the FCC will rule, however, when uh, they do reinspect the science. So we can't say that just because there's been an appeals court ruling that somehow or another uh, we know where to go. But what we can do, and this gets to the third piece, uh, instead of such speculating, we need to get at the reality. There have been a number of assertions, including this evening, about uh, health threats, terrible health threats, and so forth. Uh, we've seen with vaccines that there can be alternate views, um, extreme positions taken uh, opposing what amounts to science. Uh, we have to make our choices based on what we think is science. Uh, if we look at what is uh, pretty much the gold standard in America, which is the National Cancer Institute at uh, America's National Institutes of Health, they say there are not these problems as are being asserted even this evening. And uh, we can make a choice, follow otherwise, but uh, I hope that we will indeed follow science just as I hope we'll follow science with vaccines. And let me say again, Thanks so much for excellent presentations. Really, very nicely done. Thank you, David. And Luis is going to come in now. Hello, Luis. Hi there. Hi there. I'm sort of like a digesting. Um, I'm digesting everybody's uh, comments because uh, I'm a listener. And, and I also want to thank you for a very thorough response. And I was impressed by how seriously you've taken some of our questions about wired versus wireless. I really appreciate that you've been exploring that. And um, I do need to have one comment here to make balance with some of with what David said, and that this question about what science is right, I don't think that's the question ultimately. I don't think there's an us versus them. I don't think there's a writer point of view. I think what's important is that we're all working together to find a system that works and supports everybody in this town. We're looking to reduce the, the impacts on the climate. We have very lofty goals right now. We have to have them for our children and our grandchildren. And that's the most important thing. So one thought that I wanted to say was that um, I was interested to speak to someone at Tantalus who um, I think you, you spoke a couple of weeks ago. I don't know, was it you? Um, I, oh, you see, Jackie, was it you who spoke to them? Um, well, actually a couple of weeks ago, the entire CMLP team um, listened to um, their offering and I've known Tantalus for a number of years. Okay, so there, so that was an answer to um, Mr. Bill Page a little bit about leveraging 
the fiber, but also about can we repurpose? Because he did say that the new technology that they have would allow us in the, in the coming year, they have this new collar, right? That would help us connect to the broadband using the meters we already have to, until we can migrate to the next meters. I don't know if you had that conversation with them um, or if people remember that. So it occurs to me that if there are still a lot of questions about AMI technology, and there's a lot of questions about whether it will be obsolete. So why not take a middle ground and take what we've got and work with Tantalus. And this is just, you know, and I can write this up for you because it's a lot, a lot more detailed in my brain, mm -hmm. but a way to, um, to work with this without going whole hog and investing so deeply in all these new meters by using what we've got, a recycling idea. And especially because we can use the broadband and we have this broadband committee, and I know you guys have been talking about how we can expand our customer, customer base. Okay, so I will write this up, but I really feel like um, let's work together to find the best solution, because this is the world we're leaving for our kids and our grandchildren. And I feel really strongly that that's the whole bottom line. It's not the money, the savings, it's how do we preserve this world? So we can do that, and we can do it in a way that serves everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. And Pamela Dritt's coming in next. Hello, Pamela. Hello, thank you. Um, I really appreciate this. I'm really looking forward to having a the ability for groups of homeowners with solar panels and battery backups to provide Conquer's own peaker plant to be used to save us from the peak on the grid by joining together and letting Concord um, use the excess battery storage uh, like they've done in several other communities across the country already. Will this enable us to do that? And I want to second everything Sheldon Hines said. And I also would like to have the science looked at instead of assertions of conspiracy theories and anti-vaxxer implications for the people that are worried about the science. Um, because remember what the world said about the worries about bisphenol in plastics that turned out to be true about Roundup uh, uh, about uh, neonic pesticides, lead paint, even asbestos. There's plenty of conspiracy theories, but I don't think most of us here are, are on that part. And could we piggyback this project in terms of funding to the broadband um, extension rollout, um, which has already been passed through Congress for monies for that. Uh, and would we be able to have meters that were wired into the fiber optic system such that uh, you could still, con still uh, avoid the, the radiation the, the Wi-Fi radiation and still participate. I'm sorry, we're at time. Jackie, do you want to um, talk about the wired solution? Yeah, sure. There are definitely options out there to be able to use the fiber that's coming into your home to read your meter. And that will definitely be included in our requirements um, and the RFP that we send to the vendor. Um, we're looking at all of those options. The peaker plant issue? Well, and that's super interesting because that really is a, an up and coming um, technology, um, even using electric vehicles as potential battery storage. So um, those will be interesting questions for the vendors to respond to. And our new electric school buses? 
<laughs> well, and and they, new, they have new uh, they have solar large batteries, solar. so that's a potential. Yep. Yeah. What happened there? Pamela, was that it? Uh, yes. Um, also, could you please consider uh, making a, a, like a big battery out of the Superfund site, the StarMet? Yeah, we are, we're looking at that stuff that is on our strategic plan. Thanks. Uh, and something that we do need. Hold on People keep jumping around. Um, and Mark or Pam Howell's coming in next. Hey, Mark. Hi, good evening. Hey, Dave. Um, so I'm going to take you back a little bit to the specific criteria that you're working on now for the vendor selection. And I have a couple of questions about the process that, I, that I'd appreciate it if you could expand on. Uh, the first question has to do with the fact that you seem to very clearly be saying that system reliability is the first priority uh, in terms of vendor selection criteria, but I'm wondering if you can give us some details on how do you differentiate between um, vendors and solution offerings in terms of reliability? What, what you know, they're all going to come in and and tell you that they'll improve your system reliability, but how do we how do we really judge which ones are are most appropriately going to improve Concord's specific system reliability? And the, the, the second part of my question also has to do with the, the vendor process. It, it seems that you're planning to issue a request for proposals, but what if the, the vendor whose solution um, appears to be the best match for our functional requirements is in fact not bidding? Um, is it just simply we only get to deal with the vendors who choose to, to bid on our project? Or are we in fact actually looking at the, I think I heard Jackie say there's about 10 different solution offerings out there. Are we really looking at all of those solution offerings and choosing the one that we think is, is really gonna, gonna match our system needs the best? Appreciate your efforts and, and I, I'm looking forward to this project as well. Thanks, Mark. Jackie, do you want to address that? Sure. Um, on your first question regarding system reliability, um, we will be uh, doing lots of reference checking. Um, there are, I would say, all of those 10 vendors have systems out there somewhere in the U.S. or the world. And um, we'll be talking to those utilities that have those systems in place, ask about their experiences. Um, many of them uh, especially those that received some of the initial stimulus funds in, in 2008, um, have really undergone quite an extensive analysis by the Department of Energy um, and quantifying some of the benefits that they've received. So we'll take a look at that, as well as some of the neighbor, our neighbors that have are using more current technology. Um, you know, Sterling and Groton all have similar systems, advanced metering systems. Um, and we'll take a look at um, the benefits that they've seen, especially among um, against system reliability. And then on the RFP side, um, you know, informally, um, I would think all of those 10 vendors know that Concord Municipal Light Plant is looking for a solution. And they will all be watching for this RFP keenly. And um, hopefully um, they'll determine that their system would be a fit and decide to submit a proposal. So just to be clear, if a vendor chose not to bid, then they would not be considered as, as our potential solution. Yeah, 
if they didn't submit a proposal, then we really couldn't evaluate their system. And where does where does cost rank in terms of the the criteria? It's it's certainly a piece of it, Mark. Um, but in reality, if if a vendor that has um, a higher solution set that we think works for Concord better than another one, we um, as a MLP can you know purchase something that's more expensive. We don't have to go with a low bid. And that just is a, a process that we follow typically in town. But um, you know, in some cases, we actually will go with a solution that's uh, better fit. It has you know more options and costs a little bit more. We've done that. We did that with our substation transformer upgrades a few years back. Um, so we have some flexibility. Being so, in terms, so in terms of the timeline, you, you anticipate the criteria for selection will be completed about the same time that you generate the RFP in the first place with the, with the weightings and the, sorry, Jackie, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, that's okay. something that I usually like to disclose to the vendor so they know how they're going to be evaluated. Um, so that's something that as a team, we'll take a look at right up front. Okay, appreciate your answers. Thank you. Thank you. And Laura Davis is coming in next. Hi, Laura. You're muted. Sorry about that. Um, so I just wanted to say that this was a really excellent presentation and I'm really excited about the climate impacts that these smart meters can have. Um, I have been so impressed and really grateful for the heat pump and EV coaching that CMLP has been providing. And I was just wondering if you've considered offering like coaching or community workshops um, about this kind of technology. I, I have a smart meter because I'm a solar customer and I feel like I don't know how to use the data that it does provide and I, like I would love like an energy data for dummies kind of workshop so that I could you know better assess my own energy use and make better choices um so just wondering if there's like a community education plan around this we currently don't have one in place but it's a great suggestion and uh you know we'll have to talk about that but I think you know the features that come with whatever solution we get you know, you're going to want to know how to use it. And I think that's something that we're going to have to be able to provide. Otherwise, it's what's the point? So I think it's a really good suggestion. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay. So we got through all the questions. Um, if, uh, if, I know a few of you are gonna send us some emails um, with some details, that'll be appreciated. We'll share that with this group. Um, and if, if you have other questions, you know, please use that email address that we um, have on the website that will consolidate all the responses. Um, Wendy, do you have any closing remarks as a chair? Um, I just wanna comment, Dave. I assume that this presentation will be up on the website. It will be. Good. Um, and I'll just ask, does anybody from the board have any additional questions? Brian? Um, Pam, Pamela Dritt asked a good question about the virtual power plant, um, but also the same question could be about the load control systems. Um, you know, ETS, I believe, kind of comes on at a certain hour each night, all the units to charge up and then shut down. Uh, would would, it, would the advanced metering infrastructure be able to uh, control individual units, maybe offset them a bit so that you could do more load shaping over the substation uh, for, the, for the entire network? Um, does, does it have that kind of granularity into its control for the direct load control systems? Laura? Oh, I think Laura's gonna correct me probably on my assumption of how it works today. <laughs> no, no, I'm not gonna correct you. I'm gonna answer your question. And okay. the answer is that with the existing um, system that we have, we are able to stagger the start oh. and stop times 
So that uh, exists today. 30 minute period. So we can start up to 15 minutes, before, say before the hour we wanna start controlling or at the time period we wanna control and it'll stagger them from 15 before to 15 after. So, so as the system grows, you're gonna have low control for um, whatever devices the homeowner allows um, and you won't have them come on as a block just in the, in the super deep, um, you know, low demand period, but you could actually feather it into to the whole area or the whole. Well, that's, that's the good news, Brian. The bad news is if we do get TOU going and our price differentials are differentiated enough, then yeah. I'm, I'm not going to be controlling that. You are. <laughs> and if everybody decides all of a sudden that, you know, 10 p.m. or whatever hour we make it, you know, to flip all their cars on and all their washing machines and everything else, you know, we'll have to look at whether there's an issue there. I've actually been doing some research with some of the other utilities that are offering TOU today to ask mm -hmm. if they're having any distribution um, voltage issues with the programs. So I'm, I'm looking into that because I'm concerned as well. Well, it'd be great to know that the system could help you if the if you do have control over some loads to work with the time of use, uh, you know, uncontrolled effects of customers. Great, thank you. I'm sure we'll talk more about it. Um, any other questions from board members? Otherwise, I will entertain a uh, motion to adjourn. Um, I move that we adjourn the meeting at uh, 8.31. Yeah. Any second? Second. Okay, roll call. Um, Brian? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Oh, I, think that, I think that was a yes. Alice? Yes. And Wendy's a yes. So um, thanks, everybody, for your participation. It's been a great session. And, and thank you to our consultants who joined us today, too, Jackie and um, Carol and... Laura and everyone. So Barbara too. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.